I'm here with Professor Powell from The Ohio State University. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know. I was wondering if you could let us know what you think the most important thing regarding the crisis is that everybody should know. Well, I think one thing, the, the crisis could have been avoided and that it was not the function of just greedy individuals, that we are really facing serious structural problems, systems problems, and unless those problems are fixed, we will actually face another crisis. And I guess the other thing I think is important for people to know is that we are talking about restructuring our financial system and our housing and mortgage system, but from our perspective, we're not talking about restructuring in a way that will fix it. And in what ways do you think the system needs restructuring? Uh, how should we go about doing that? Well, a couple of things. If you think about the banking and, and financial system, which is larger than this banking, uh, when it first came online as a national system in the middle of the, the 19th, the late, early part of the 19th century, there was a whole lot of debate about why do we need banks, why do we need national currency, and the whole idea was that it's in service of the economy and people. Uh, today, we sort of forget that, that the, the banks and the financial system is really there to serve uh, the members of society, citizens, uh, and facilitate their commerce. If we're not doing that, we don't really need banks. I'm not suggesting we get rid of banks, but I'm suggesting that we realign banks so they're really serving people. Um, which, and right now, the banking system is not being ridden with that in mind. It's been ridden as an insider game. Um, if you think about the money that was used in the bank bailout, that money wasn't loaned. Uh, the idea was to create liquidity in the market. It didn't do that. It was used to pay um, uh, bonuses. It was to pay off, off uh, write off some toxic debts. Uh, totally misuse of public money. That was public money, uh, $800 billion that we gave to banks, uh, and no liquidity. There's been no serious modification of mortgages, uh, and so all the money stayed up top. Uh, and again, I don't think that we should necessarily let the banks fail, but we should insist that they serve the people. If they're not doing that, uh, it's a serious problem. And because there's some complexity in the banking system, um, to do that requires some clear statement as to what the purpose is. It doesn't just require tinkering with one rule or another rule. Okay. And you had talked about the two-credit system that is in the U.S. that we have today. I was wondering if you could elaborate just a little bit on what you mean by that. Sure. Um, probably many uh, people have heard of a dual school system. Uh, which we had in this country until Brown and to some extent still have. But the idea was that we had a school basically for whites and a school f uh, for blacks and non uh, other non-whites. And what Brown and the subsequent cases following Brown and the Civil Rights Movement suggested that we need to have one school system. The courts talk about a unitary school system. Other people have talked about we have a dual housing market. And again, before Brown and the end of Jim Crow, we clearly had um, housing that was red line, uh, housing with different credit and different physical space uh, for whites and non-whites. Again, with Title VIII in 1968 and then again 1988, we started moving to the idea of deliberately trying to create one housing market that's just for everyone in America. We are not there by a long shot, but that's the goal. Uh, and then in uh, 1974 and 77, we started really looking at credit seriously. Uh, and in some ways it shouldn't be surprising we have a dual credit system. We have a credit system, uh, so if you look at, whether you look at subprime loans, whether you look at uh, access to loans, it's not, they're under different terms if you're either uh, black or Latino or you live in a black or Latino community. Uh, and again, that's called redlining. Uh, the subprime loans were uh, targeted to those communities. The foreclosure is impacting those communities. Uh, and part of that's building on the housing segregation uh, that came out of the 1930s and 40s. Uh, so a lot of our credit system is around housing, not all that we have uh, uh, credit system around schools and uh, business as well. Um, and so despite laws on the books that talk about fair credit, we actually have a dual credit system, uh, one for largely for white middle class and one for other folks, and if you and the the credit system that's for white middle class is actually a better system. It's a flawed system as well, but it's you get loans, you get more loans, you get more access to credit on better terms. Uh, so the terms of credit are quite different. 
the Federal Reserve Board has done a number of studies, they've been humble studies. Every study has shown that there's consistently disparities that are not accounted for based on uh, uh, underwriting standards, based on the income of the person. They're based largely on race. There's, um, and all the talk about changing the credit system that's being discussed today at the uh, Federal Reserve Board and the Treasury would actually make that problem worse. Uh, so uh, they haven't really embraced the notion that we should have a unitary credit system. And in fact, the banking industry is saying even the weak laws that are in place, put in place in the 1970s and eight, uh, 70s, um, <clears throat> should be removed. But we should let the market do what it does best, which is not to, to focus on issues of inclusiveness or fairness at all, but just to make money. But that's not what banks are for. They're not just to make money. Um, and, and every uh, market and every banking system requires rules and regulations. The question is, what are the right rules and right regulations, and how do we actually include all people? And if we don't do that, it's not a good banking system. So you see the push to blame Fannie and Freddie for the crisis, the push to blame the Community Reinvestment Act, almost as a reflection of the preference of certain members of Congress of the banking system as their preference for the two-credit system? Yeah, I mean, they, they, the, uh, you know, the story that gets told around this obviously is quite important. The, the, uh, as, as many of the people listening will know, um, the uh, prime loans function fairly well. Wall Street, relatively conservative newspaper, uh, in 2006 and 2007 said 55% of the people who got uh, subprime loans should have gotten prime loans, which means, in a sense, they would have gotten cheaper money. They would have had a, chance, a better chance for those loans to perform. Uh, but instead, it's, it's you know the because of the discourse in this country, which uh, around race is like it must be their fault, and uh, there's been only one um, uh, lawsuit to date dealing with the secondary market, which is more important than the banks themselves in terms of understanding the dynamics and mechanics of um, subprime loans, um, and that was uh, against Goldman Sachs that created. Um, subprime loans, uh, generated these loans, and then sold them to Wall Street investors and bet that they would fail. Um, so no one talked about the stupid Wall Street investors, no one talked about the fact that they should have uh, go, to, go back and get become financially literate. The whole purpose of these uh, instruments was to be obscure uh, and to bet on that they would fail. But those were not just investments, those were mortgages that were went to the black and Latino community no sympathy, no work on the part of justice, the department coming back, no work in the SEC saying, and we should make sure those underlying homeowners um, are made whole. We want to make sure that the Wall Street investors, who are the most elite uh, part of our society, the richest part of our society, we're concerned about them, but we're not concerned about uh, the black Latino community or the poor white community that uh, got these loans. Uh, the rules they're talking about now in terms of uh, qualify residential mortgages uh, in terms of down payments, uh, in terms of new underwriting laws, uh, in terms of privatizing um, the GSEs, all these things without any real look at uh, strengthening uh, CRE or uh, would make things substantially worse. And moving forward, how do you feel the government should act in order to fix this problem that still exists in the U.S.? Well, again, the goal should be very clear because it's such a complicated system, it's hard to, pick, to focus on a single thing. But the goal should be how do we, I mean, if you look at the, the uh, President Bush, George uh, W. Bush, talked about the disparity in terms of home ownership in the black community and white community and the Latino community. He actually came up with a plan to actually close that gap. Uh, can't think of him as a, a liberal or a radical at all, but he was saying there's a problem with this huge disparity, and this disparity in sense is historic. We created this system in the 1930s and 40s where when racial discrimination was explicit. It's never been fixed. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, President Bush, President Clinton, both made efforts to actually try to fix this. The present crisis is making it worse. All the, um, the, the, the um, traction, the, the movement that we made over the last 30 years has been wiped out by this. Uh, the um, wealth disparity, which is largely reflected in home ownership, not exclusively, between the black and Latino community on one hand and the white community, uh, has essentially doubled in the last four years. Uh, 
uh, and there's been no talk, none, about what should be the government intervention in terms of doing this. And people want, sometimes think about this is just a market. There's no such thing as just a market. And of course, housing is the most uh, complicated, uh, one of the most complicated regulated um, uh, pieces of the market in existence. We buy housing based on uh, uh, FHA, uh, based on credit, based on appraisals, <coughs> based on a whole lot of regulatory systems. And on top of that, we have a different housing market and a different credit system for uh, non-whites, and that's just not appropriate. So we talk about moving to a system where we have a country of renters and a country of homeowners, and without acknowledgement that this, that this difference will be racially encoded and that the one part of society will continue to be able to build wealth and another society will be locked out. Do you see any hope for the future, or do you think it will take another crisis as several presenters today have? Said? Well, I think, you know, I think one of the things that the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement I think is quite important because I think if you think about the response to the credit crisis that, that came from the Tea Party, their response was to uh, lop onto the story about uh, the inadequate borrowers from the black and Latino community with racial tinge uh, language without disregarding the facts, but also all of their hostility was directed toward the government uh, and, uh, and, and some hostility toward quote-unquote unworthy borrowers. What the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, has the potential of doing is saying, wait a minute, you know, up until this crisis the country was growing fa fairly fast. Now some of it was, was fool's goal, but, uh, and what was different is that the growth was not being shared. It was all being captured by uh, certainly the 1 percent, maybe even the less than 1 percent. Um, so in, in many ways, it's not just blacks and Latinos that have been losing ground. Uh, whites have been losing ground too in terms of elites, and it's not sustainable. Uh, and so uh, that's potentially hopeful, and I think that that reality, as people become aware of it, uh, creates the possibility of having some action now. Now, when you say that we have to wait for another crisis, we are in a crisis. Uh, you know, unemployment is still around the, uh, officially 9%, but as you know, if you're not looking for a job, you don't count. Right, right. So it's like everyone says uh, uh, real people not participating in the workforce are probably twice that. And the black community in some places 50%, and Native American community in some places 60%. Um, and there's no real jobs plan. Um, and uh, um, the percentage of participation by corporations and the elites in terms of taxes uh, has been declining um, since 1975 and really took off with Reagan. Um, you know, we, we had a, a country where there was a shared prosperity. The country grow, rich people get richer, but middle class, poor people participate as well. Uh, that was the deal we made since World War II. That deal has been broken. So, um, uh, so I think re reclaiming that uh, becomes one of the ways out of this. Do you think one of the problems is that in the 1980s with Reaganomics, there's a push towards the financialization of the economy where you have profits in the financial sector really taking over profits from the productive sector. I think, yes, and I also think the language was, you know, we sort of, the language is not useful because uh, Reagan and, and, and um, I, a lot of people on the right argues about market in some sort of uh, abstract way that's not real, unregulated market. There's no such thing, there never will be. Uh, but also they talked about the government being the problem and we need to turn things over to uh, private. Um, it's actually, the, the, the economy is not between the government and the private sector. Uh, there are actually four sectors. There is public, which you think of as government or collective action. Uh, there is private, which if you go back to Jefferson and Washington, uh, when they mean private, they mean individuals, they mean small farmers, they mean artisans. Uh, and uh, they were not just suspicious of large government. Adam Smith wrote uh, tomes about uh, the fear of corporations. Um, and the third section is non-public, non-private, which in that section you have people who don't have a public voice and don't have a, a private space to retreat to. So people like uh, uh, immigrants, historically uh, in the 19th century, women were in that space. They, they, weren't, they didn't have a public voice. And the home was the man's castle and the woman's dungeon. Uh, so the woman didn't have a public or private space. Uh, people who are ex-offenders. Uh, so anyway, there's a third space is non-public, non-private, and the fourth space is corporate. Uh, 
uh, and so when people talk about public and private, oftentimes they really mean public and corporate. And when you enhance the corporate space, you actually decrease not just the public space, you actually decrease the private space, which means people have less freedom, not more. Uh, people have less resources, not more. Uh, people have less, less privacy, not more. Uh, you go to a corporation, you don't have free speech rights in a corporation. Uh, and you enhance the non-private and non-public. And so we need to have an alignment, a proper alignment. Corporations make good servants and bad masters. Uh, so this is not saying we don't need corporations. So Roosevelt understood this. Uh, Henry Ford understood this. Um, um, uh, Rockefeller understood this. Uh, um, that we don't have an alignment with corporations today. They're, they're, uh, they're not in service of the people. Um, and uh, the, the potentially um, the movement uh, Occupy Wall Street can sharpen this. Uh, but it's also important to understand why is it so hard to get people to pay attention to that. And again, there's a whole long history uh, related to who are we as a people and race in this country that needs to be engaged as well if we're going to deal with that. Well, on behalf of economics, New Economics Perspectives, I'd like to thank you for your time. It's, it really has been a pleasure. Thank you.